All right. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to have you all uh, with us here, of course. Thank you for taking the time from your busy schedule and uh, getting together for this program. It's going to be really interesting. First of all, uh, welcome back to Court Lindahl. Uh, you were with us most recently. Thank you for uh, coming on back again. Well, it's great to be here, Henrik. I appreciate it. And it's good to finally be here to speak with uh, John and David as well. Really good. Uh, John Cale, a few years ago now, since we talked about the uh, Charleston star map, but I'm looking forward to revisiting this today and, of course, tying into our discussion and whatever kind of, I guess, new material and new insights you have about this. So uh, welcome back again, uh, John. How are you? Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Really good. And then lastly, we have uh, Dave Truman joining us from Bolivia today. It was, of course, in 2007, I believe, that we had Dave, uh, Dave last with us briefly. We, we talked about the uh, conference he was putting together in Liverpool, Beyond Knowledge. Uh, Dave was part of that and, and it was a really good turnout, did a great job on that. So it's good to talk to you again, Dave. It was a while ago. What uh, what have you been up to? Oh, quite a lot, really. Um, I've, I've sort of changed from being a sort of distributor of knowledge to a researcher, I suppose, in the last four or five years. So, um, yeah, I've been enjoying myself traveling around. A few ups and downs, though. Bolivia at the moment, and you've, you've written some articles for uh, Quartz magazine uh, as well. We'll uh -huh. get into some of this later on because it's a pretty interesting time. I think, well, let's begin with Court first. You have a lot of new material, uh, Shugborough Hall mystery, the Renle Chateau mystery. This is where you, some of the latest things that you're uh, looking at, Court. Let's kind of begin there, I guess, and let's get, uh, get things started here. Okay, well, I'm, I'm really excited about that because it's very interesting, and all those places may indeed tie together through the same people that um, maybe were discussed in uh, Henry Lincoln, uh, Bainget, and then Lay's book, uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, in the Priory of Zion. And uh, a lot of people, you know, don't believe that the Priory of Zion is a real group of people, and that's entirely possible because of the way that unfolded in the story with uh, Pierre Plantard possibly being uh, a, a con man, but uh, he may have just recognized something that already existed and tried to use it to his own ends. Because what we see is a, a pattern of personalities such as Admiral Anson and his brother Thomas Anson of Shugborough Hall, along with uh, Sir Francis Dashwood, uh, who owned the West Wickham estate there near London. Uh, building a series of follies or whimsical pieces of architecture on their property that all had hidden meanings and uh, attributes to it and directional attributes, uh, obviously, uh, from what I study. So what we see is, is kind of a veneration of the Tower of the Winds in Athens, Greece, which was uh, built in the second century B.C., and was a very advanced uh, timekeeping device and may have actually allowed the Greeks to fit, fix longitude. And, and also, as we've discussed before, uh, that activity would have all kinds of spiritual and uh, talismanic overtones as, you know, we know that uh, everything practical and uh, religious was intermingled in those eras. So we have later in the 18th century these men all doing the tour of of Europe and the Middle East as well and uh, either being told or prompted to go on kind of a, a a path of enlightenment through Europe where they learned all the secrets of of this architecture and among that would be the directional attributes of the Tower of the Winds which uh, is an octagonal structure and uh, it does behave uh, as an axis mundi. And the most interesting and compelling part about the Tower of the Winds is that the 315-degree azimuth created by this octagon leads straight to Avebury, right to the circle in Avebury. So mm. it's, it's kind of like they have two geodetic points on the Earth that they were you know, referencing together there. And... You know, my research did indicate that, you know, the Celtic culture did ex extend to Greece earlier in history. And awareness of this from travel or using the resources that were in England could have made them aware that this was there and to respect it somehow. And uh, we see this later echoed because when the Ansons build their copy of the Tower of the Winds on the Shugborough estate, it's oriented 
such that it points an azimuth straight through the middle of Avebury and straight through the middle of Stonehenge, all in one line. Hmm. So this is a pretty amazing association of the Antons paying respect to the, you know, the ancient megalithic culture in Britain. And, and also interesting, too, is the other two Tower of the Winds also behave as axis in England, one on Sir Francis Dashwood's estate, and the other one is at Mount Stuart near uh, Belfast, Ireland. And the, that Tower of the Winds and the one in Shugborough are oriented to actually point the way to each other. So the one in Mount Stewart that was built later in 1800, we see the one in Shugborough being built in the mid-1700s, around 1750. The actual uh, date of construction is debated. But it's really interesting that the, the uh, Marquis of Londonderry opted to build his Tower of the Winds there in Belfast and orient it toward Shugborough hmm. as well. So they these guys are going on some kind of... Uh um, educational course, uh, you think uh, that they're 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 being taught the the secrets of, of this kind of knowledge, and then they uh, disseminate it and, and and do it and build these kinds of uh, replicas on, on their own properties and and stuff like that. Yes, if they have the means to, that's obviously part of the uh, what goes on. You know, in being able to even build an array such as this, you're either a a, a public entity, you know, a state or very wealthy and can do it yourself and that's why here in the modern world we do see corporate interests and uh, businesses creating arrays or campuses that they set up with statuary and arranged architecture and such so that, that that's really interesting that they seem to be referencing uh, Avebury um, which is you know the oldest uh, culture in Britain and a lot of, obviously isn't known about it. Everybody knows that those structures have been there for so long and nobody's really sure exactly which culture created them or not. So it's strange that, that you know, Europeans or people in Greece would be referencing Avebury. But we, we all know that there's theories of trade that, that aren't exactly accepted by the mainstream that say this could be true. But... Um, What's also interesting about, obviously, Shugborough Hall is the Shepherd's Monument there. And there's there's been a lot uh, said about that through the work of Lewis Buff Perry, who, who uh, decoded the strange inscription on there. It's just a series of letters with dots between them. But uh, he deciphered it and came up with the fact that the Stone of Destiny, or one of the teraphim, or holy biblical stones, was hidden on the Shugborough estate and all of the lore associated with the Shepherd's Monument says that the Shepherd's Monument will quote point the way to the Holy Grail. Now using the techniques that I've used I measured the angular orientation of the Shepherd's Monument itself and the northwest azimuth led right to the International Peace Garden on the border of the United States and Canada which is interesting because my theory to this point has been that that's a special axis of import in American history that was visited long before history says that was possible as well and we have the octagonal powder magazine in Colonial Williamsburg which is also seems to be referencing the Tower of the Winds as a reproduction pointing the way right to the International Peace Garden we have the Newport Tower in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, pointing the way to the Kensington Runestone in a solstice event. And we have the octagon at the Peace Garden pointing to the Kensington Runestone. Hmm. So, and also, you know, what Mr. Uh, Lewis Buff Perry was involved in was the Stone of Destiny, and he had identified a sandstone pillar very close to the, the border of the United States and Canada that had the Hebrew inscription of Preston written on it and an alcove dug into the pillar where the stone used to be. So we have that on the same latitude as the International Peace Garden as well. And that's another way of geo-referencing things to a certain axis in addition to the arcs that are extended by the octagons. Hmm. 
So it all seems to point to the International Peace Garden being of a place of importance. I mean, even Admiral Anson is involved in the tale of the stone that came from the sandstone pillar because he pirated it away from the French. Hmm. On the way, oh, they were bringing it back to France, and his squadron intercepted the Admiral Jean Pierre's fleet and captured the stone. And that's a strange story, too, because it, it smacks of being a setup almost that possibly both these men were Knights Templar or members of a, 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 a pendant organization that had more concern with the safety of the stone than whoever possessed it. They might have had right. more allegiance to their group than uh, nationality. And it's strange, too, because after the fleet was repaired, after Anson got the stone, the fleet went to France and was repaired and was getting to return to the West Indies when he intercepted the fleet again and captured a person known as the Marquis of St. George. And many people suspect that this individual was indeed St. Germain. The real, uh, the real one, huh? The real deal. The, the real, the actual one. I've been looking into him a little bit, and he actually was a real person. He's mm -hmm. not just a figment or a fairy tale. And there are, have been some uh, sources I'm trying to track down of Lady Anson actually speaking of St. Germain in some of her correspondence. So here we have this uh, St. Germain, too, is is reported to have been the one that created the order of strict observance which i suspect is the group of people that are arranging these tower of the winds and these geographic uh, associations in this era i think they're using a technique that they learned from ancient times and from other alchemical uh, sources and using it uh, for their own ends to communicate and for intelligence purposes tell us um, the order or the, or the right of strict observance what that is for those who don't know court Right. The, the, uh, the right of strict observance was seemingly uh, more oriented to France and Germany than in England that we know, but we know there were secret connections between the Knights Templar too, irregardless of what nationality they were. And uh, some of the sources say that St. Germain actually created the order of strict observance, and this was a an order of masonry that likely Alexander von Humboldt was a member of and Thomas Jefferson was said to be a member of and th those are kind of sketchy sources and I'm trying to track down better ones but, and we know what a mystery it is with Thomas Jefferson and his Masonic papers are missing so but uh, the order of strict observance uh, may be what Admiral Anson was a member of and may be actually associated with the Hellfire Club the so-called Hellfire Club of Sir Francis Dashwood may have been a kind of a cover for uh, some of their activities. Hmm. And re really, the Hellfire Club was not uh, known as the Hellfire Club. There were several different Hellfire Clubs, but uh, Dashwood's group was called the Monks of Medenham Abbey. And they actually met in an old Cistercian monastery near the West Wickham Estate where Dashwood built all his follies there. And... Um, and that's interesting, too, because the Cistercian Order is associated with the creation of the Knights Templar. Right. Well, and again, I mean, they, these are the guys who were traveling out to different parts of the world, building up their towers, um, mapping a lot of you know places and following the, the salt lines and stuff like that. So if they had some kind of knowledge about, uh, um, you know, countries previously unexplored or what have you, I think it would be within their order for sure. Yes, definitely. They, they also, you know, we have the missing Templar fleet, and a lot of people suspo uh, suppose that this led to, you know, the the legends of pirates, and and a whole different, um, you know, possibly earlier intervention in North America. So it all fits in with what we see with the Kensington runestone, which has a date of 1362, and uh, possibly other places in. Uh, the United States that are thought to be Native American sites but were probably influenced by this group of people like the Newark Earthworks in Ohio uh, which has an interesting feature there that's oriented towards the Great Pyramid of Giza 
at the same angle as the slope sides of the pyramid at at, at uh, 51.8 degrees. Mm. Wow. So, I, yeah, I have a video about that. It's a large circular feature with an octagonal feature connected to it via a small corridor, and the linear orientation of that points to the Great Pyramid. Uh, and, and by the way, sorry to interrupt you, I still have to mention this because as you were talking about the right of strict observance, I think it's an important uh, note to make that it, it's introduced um, basically by Baron Karl Gotthelf von Hund, a, a German, you know, uh, nobility, aristocrat, whatever, uh, a baron, basically, and he is, of course, one who is very prominent in the in the actual Illuminati. Later on, he's brought in. He's believed to be, uh, you know, he's he's claimed to have a direct descendant from the Knights Templar and the Rosicrucians, and he he joins the Order of the Illuminati pretty early on and is brought in by uh, Weishaupt. So um, I think that's yes. a pretty interesting note to make. Yes, and coincidentally, the, the, that. It, it was an interesting story because he, at one point, he came forward because he felt he had been abandoned by the leaders of the strict observance, and a lot of people think they were connected with the Jacobite rebellion in England because, uh, after the, at about the same time he was abandoned, a lot of those people were either killed or arrested in the in the 40, uh, 1745 Jacobite rebellion in in England. Right. Yeah. So, and that. Also, the, the tie-in with the Priory of Zion, uh, Zion with von Hund is interesting also because the list he supplied of past Grand Masters matched the list that Pierre Pontard su uh, supplied uh, for the Grand Masters of the Priory of Zion. So here we had the same man uh, much earlier in history supplying a very similar list of people as being the Grand Master, past Grand Masters. Hmm. So well, Link, Lincoln and in, in Holy Blood and Holy Grail, they made that connection as well. Wow, cool. Yeah, there's a link to Preston as well, um, because uh, when the Jacobites moved, marched south into England from Scotland with Bonnie Prince Charlie, they actually sacked Preston and took the city, for, well, what's nowadays a city, from, from the um, Hanoverians. Um, and in fact, they almost actually... Uh, got rid of the Hanoverians, which, in my opinion, would have been a good thing. But um, yeah, so there is another time with Preston there caught. Yeah, exactly. And w there we have, as I described before, the sandstone pillar that Perry found had the word Preston inscribed mm. in Hebrew, and it's on the same latitude as the Peace Garden. And then mm. if you go to the octagon at the International Peace Garden, it points a 45 degree angle right to Preston, England. Wow. So there's maybe a hidden clue there as well of these geographic associations where you go to point A, you know, to point B, back to point A, and you can find the way to the next clue. So that's that's kind of maybe one of the purposes of these arrays, too, is kind of like a vision quest that that involves people figuring this out at a certain level of initiation. Yeah, yeah, yes. interesting. Yeah. Dave, any, more, any further comments on that? Um, I, ju I just find it interesting that the same themes keep coming up time and time again because certainly with South America, for example, there is also a connection with the Knights Templar um, in that when, um, in 1307, when Philip IV and the, the Pope conspired to get rid of the Templar order, um, some of the fleet fled south into Portugal and um, those Knights Templar were, were basically um, looked after by uh, King Dinis I of Portugal, and he created the order of um, the Knights of Christ. And uh, the Knights of Christ were uh, seafarers, basically, and as soon as the Templars come, Knights of Christ arrived in Portugal within very few years, um, the Portuguese era of expansion and exploration began. And in fact, Dinis the first son, Alfonso the fourth of Portugal, uh, became a Grand Master of the Order. And what's also interesting is that certain family connections uh, link in with all this, because at the time the Portuguese kings were of the sort of cadet branch of the House of Burgundy, and one of the founding members of the Knights Templar, sort of two, three hundred years before, was a guy called André de Montbard, who was also of the same family. So, you know, all these things seem to tie in very much so. Oh, indeed. Um, 
And John, later I want to tie in Charleston because certainly this is where the American branch, if you will, of this, all of this is set up. The American Scottish Rite is started in Charleston. I um, want to ask you more about the star map. If we uh, keep for a moment a little bit more on your work, Dave, um, tell, tell us about, you mentioned something interesting to us earlier about how geomancy is used to uh, established um, nations. It, it, it has a deeper kind of meaning to it. Talk a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Well, I can pick up on Scottish right, right Freemasonry, actually, because um, what I found was that um, I studied the sort of liberation wars during the, well, around the turn of the centuries, 18th to 19th centuries, uh, between the emerging countries in South America, the republics, and the Spanish imperial Spanish Empire, basically, and if you if you don't actually dig too deeply beneath the surface, you get this sort of impression that Freemasonry played a major role at the time. That all these liberators, such as Juan San Martín or um, um, Bernardo Higgins, who was the first president of Chile, were Freemasons. But in fact, they weren't. What's interesting is that um, it seems as if there was a sort of re writing of history about 40 or 50 years later and um, Freemasonry became more important in the popular accounts of history that, that emerged after that time. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's quite fascinating to see how history has been remolded in some certain ways to, to emphasize the role of Freemasonry. Why do you but, think they did this, Dave? Why does this happen? Sorry? Why do you think they did this? Uh, they want to... Um, um, seem more important than they actually are? Well, why did they do this, do you think? Um, well, I think it was about the establishment of a national identity in, in these new countries. Um, take the example of Uruguay, for example. Um, the, the popular myth of the foundation of Uruguay is that it was founded by 33 Orientals who basically fought off the Portuguese stroke Brazilians in the um, land to the east of the Uruguay River to establish this new country. In fact, the real history is nothing like that at all. Um, what happened was that um, it was a very fluid situation in, in Arge what's now Argentina and Uruguay at the time. Um, and basically, Uruguay was always a, a sort of um, area of struggle between the Portuguese Brazilians and the Spanish-speaking people. And it was very unstable politically. And Britain was basically importing most of its beef from there during that period. We're talking about the 1840s, 50s, whatever. And Britain decided that it had had enough of all these skirmishes and fightings and it wanted something more stable. So it um, created something called the Treaty of Montevideo, which created the state of Uruguay. But the popular myth is that these 33 people came in patriotically, fought off the Brazilians, and created the country. But mm. nothing like that really happened. In reality, there were these people, but there weren't 33 of them. And they weren't Orientals in the sense that they came from the land to the east of the Uruguay River. Some of them were from what's now Paraguay and Argentina and what have you. Um, but this was sort of superimposed on the real history to give a sort of Masonic overlay to everything. Interesting. So, the number 33, Oriental. They're both prominent aspects of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Sure. Not only that, but when you look at the sort of geomantical aspects of this, uh, I first came to Uruguay last year, <clears throat> and um, I discovered that there was a town called Trenta y Tres, which means 33 in Spanish. So I thought I'd go there curiosity, because I thought there might be a Masonic connection with it. When I got there, I found that, that there's a small town, um, provincial capital in the northeast of Uruguay. It's got this huge um, obelisk dominating the whole town. It was built in about the 1950s and made of concrete. And then I discovered that this town, 33, actually lies on the 33rd parallel south of the equator. Hmm. It even has a postcode, which is 33,000. It's as if everything's been done to establish the identity of Uruguay and these 33 orient Orientals, so-called, in terms of Scottish Rite Freemasonry and the national identity of Uruguay. The, also, obelisks seem to be put in places that are to do with the birth of new nations. In Chile, there's a suburb of Santiago called Maipú, 
and Maipu actually is also on the 33rd parallel, and it was seen as a battle that created the Chilean nation when San Martin um, basically defeated the Spanish, and there's a huge obelisk there as well. So, mm. you know, it's, it's quite strange the way all this happens, but it's as if this is this sort of Scottish Rite Freemason masonry overlay on, on the real history that actually took place to impress on the psyche of the nation that masonry plays an important part in their identity. Isn't that interesting? They're kind of uh, perpetuating a myth and, and to making it seem uh, that they're more important in, in hindsight. John, let's, let's tie in Charleston in this as well. We want to hear a little bit about the the star Excellent. map and, and, and kind of where, where you're coming from in, in all of this as well. Well, there's many things I could comment on that was said. Um, as far as the, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, I would definitely agree with that notion. But as far as Charleston goes, it seems that there were many different groups and not just the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. However, it seemed like um, amongst of amongst these groups that are out there, they're, they're all in kind of a competition amongst themselves because it was a, a popular thing to be uh, living, I guess you could say. So you see it everywhere, um, coming from different um, variations of Freemasonry. And uh, I just find it interesting uh, that uh, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry was probably the later group that, that started um, claiming all this other Freemasonic um, history. But what I have found, in, in going back to the park, I revisited one of the parks that's um, associated with the star Cursa, and it is the, the only park that is in the star map that is of an octagonal shape when you're looking above it. And I found that this particular park itself was uh, really interesting because it's also, it has, well, there's many things to talk about this particular park. Uh, first of all, it, it's, it has a Washington Monument, which is a very tall obelisk that stands in the middle of the park. And then around the sides of the park are um, commemorations to various people. Um, all throughout the park or the parks of Charleston, there isn't very much at all when it comes to uh, the Templar Knights. As far as sim symbolism goes, you don't really see too much um, referring to the Templar Knights except for one monument that I found that is in this particular park, the octagonal park, the park that holds the Washington Monument. And it is a, uh, a statue that, or an, it's a, a sort of Masonic structure that is giving honor to a man named Francis Salvador. And uh, on his, on it, it says, Francis Salvador, 1747 to 1776, and he was the first Jew in South Carolina to hold public office and to die for American independence. Hmm. And above his name is a Templar knight uh, holding a wand in his right hand, and he was holding a skull in his left hand, and there's a man on his knee that is uh, obviously being knighted by this Templar Knight. So I just wanted to throw that in there. I thought that was kind of interesting because I haven't seen any Templar Knight associations as far as the artwork that still exists in these parks except for this one location. Huh. Interesting. Now, can you give us the basic outline of the of the Charleston star map, uh, John, and then later we can we can talk about if Charleston was built basically on an ancient astrological, uh, astro theological premise, or if this was kind of a superimposed onto the uh, city later on. What would you have, whatever you think there? But give us the basic outline again of the star map. Well, uh, I started to take my lunch breaks when I was working around the area, and every time I would go to 
somewhere to take my lunch. It happened to be a park that was downtown Charleston. And so every time I went to a park, I, I pinned it on Google Earth. And after a while, it started to present a picture to me uh, because I was aware of the other alignments of various structures around the world. Um, and so I started to think, hmm, maybe there's something behind these parks in Charleston. And uh, essentially, I started to think, you know, Orion, the constellation of Orion, was uh, the first place to start with this because it's so common around the world. And uh, but I found that the stars weren't matching up with their meaning unless. I flipped everything upside down, um, and then when I began to do, see that, do that, all the stars and all of the parks in Charleston match up with meaning that are one and the same. I'll give you an example. This is probably the most obvious one. It's in a park called the Battery that is right downtown Charleston, and um, there's a statue there that's on that's the main focus of the park and the statue itself is a goddess and her and the goddess is obviously Minerva because uh, Minerva has a a particular pendulum that she wears around her neck that looks like Medusa um, if you look in old images of of, of her you'll see this, this the similarities and so um, we have Minerva, uh, who is a goddess of war, and we have uh, the Leatrix, the star, which has been associated with as being a goddess of war as well. And so basically all the locations that are, that are major areas of downtown Charleston, which are major parks commemorating various um, wars throughout history, mm -hmm. they all are part of this part uh, of the star system that matches up pretty well. Yeah, it does. And so uh, yeah. I've been studying this. Yeah, now, how how back how far back do we need to go to um, when this actually was completed? Then, if we look at all the components that make up the uh, the representation of the stars, if you will, because one of my contention was, wait a minute, I wonder if because we know that ancient cities are based on principles, in some cases, on, on, on stars, where they are positioned, they want to have certain streets, actually, um, in, in alignment, and, and etc. And I was thinking, I wonder if the same thing was with Charleston, if it was like that from the beginning, from the get-go. Uh, if not, obviously, they would have to had cho cho they, they chose the areas and the locations where to place these monuments at a much later date. Is, is that what happened, John? Well, there has been a history of many battles and wars. And it's just a bloody history in Charleston. It's been burnt down. Um, and to me, like, I, I, I see that they've been rebuilding over the same areas uh, for various, over various periods of time. And uh, I would say that that, Whenever something fell down, they went and built something on top of it and uh, have just kept these areas alive ever since. But there are newer parks in the area that, that are, you know, within – that were built within the past 30 years or so. But they've, been, they've just been modernized and though this, the same um, emphasis in these areas have been tried to – you know, they try to keep it the same, though. But I do see that, like, things have been destroyed and then built again and then destroyed and built again. Right. But I, I have a feeling that it even goes way further than the colonization of these people. I think it – actually, I, I, I've been trying to get into uh, more research into this, but I, I have a feeling that a lot of these places were Native American sacred – places that goes back thousands of years right now I'm just trying to keep digging and there's just more and more to dig in around uh, you know you have everything from 
the times of slavery to the times of the pirates that were here in Charleston. So it, it's really hard to know when and who built it, everything because so many people are behind it all. Exactly. Now, um, Court, let's go back to you again and, and tie this in because you, you talked about Anson before and he has an interesting connection to, uh, to Charleston as well. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, Admiral Anson at the time when he was a captain, I believe it was in the 17, I think it was 1724 to 1735, he actually lived in Charleston and uh, a part of Charleston was named Ansonboro for uh, Captain Anson as he had won that property in a poker game <laughs> for, from Gadsden who, who later was one of the... the a bigger statesman of, of South Carolina and a famous South Carolinian. And uh, it's interesting, as John was saying before, that John told me, too, that when the Scottish Rite was founded, it was founded in the Shepherd's Tavern, if I'm right, John. Is that correct? Yep. And that, that may be a, a small tie into the Shepherd's Monument or that value of that uh, representation of Christ by uh, Admiral Anson. Possibly, and I have read some accounts. Also, we were discussing the the order of strict observance earlier that that might have morphed into the Scottish Rite, in part, because what I read about the Scottish Rite, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, John, was that that establishment in uh, Charleston was was international. I think that was the first Scottish Rite of uh, of. Uh, founding ever like even the the french uh and scottish right in scotland actually refers to the scottish right in the united states mm. uh, I, I think yes, that's what there's I a heard. monument <laughs> yeah yeah the monument that's downtown says on this site stood shepherd's tavern the birthplace of the ancient and accepted scottish right of freemasonry the mother supreme council of the world may 3rd 1801 and then yeah. it has a list of all the founders yeah that's a little known fact i think most people obviously because the name assume that it's associated with scotland mostly or france when you really look into the scottish right a lot of the the their uh, ethics ethos and philosophy uh, developed in France and with, then with the Normans that left France and went to Scotland and, and England, then it became uh, part more part of it there until it was actually established in South Carolina. So that's very interesting too. And also, you know, part of the things I've been learning too about the Scottish Rite are the, the, the Kabbalistic uh, overtones of the Scottish Rite. You know, you have Albert Pike writing that that is one of the main uh, tenets of masonry. And that this leads me back to, uh, again, of all places, to rain le chateau in France. Because just recently, I've been learning about Girona, Spain, which is one of the earliest uh, schools of the Kabbalah in Europe. And the way the Kabbalah developed the European version of you know, assumed some of the mythology and lore and alchemical uh, practices that were already in Europe as well. So that's an interesting uh, uh, tie-in as well. And I, I was looking at Rain Le Chateau as an axis because there is an octagonal uh, feature in the chapel, which isn't standard in every Catholic church. And there's another similar octagonal feature in Rosalind Chapel in Scotland. So I examined Rain Le Chateau as an axis, and it did seem to define uh, many of the places. I, I, the building there is oriented at 87 degrees, so I, I uh, created my axis based on that. And one of the main rays coming off of that matched the pentagram that Henry Lincoln had delineated in the Rain Le Chateau area using features years ago. And that was really interesting because first I, I drew the octagonal templum and turned it off and then I drew the star and as soon as I, you know, brought the templum back up, it matched the star right away. So that was really interesting there when that happened. <laughs> but uh, as I studied, I began to uh, find out uh, the work of a woman named P Patrice Chaplin who as a youth had spent time in Girona, Spain. And... Uh, 
she uh, says that she witnessed things that, that indicated that the father, Sonier, from uh, Rain La Chateau, who was the first one to expose the mystery there, and the Catholic priest who came into a lot of money, and he later built follies at Rain La Chateau, just like Anson and Dashwood had earlier in England. So it seems like the, these this group of people is expressing themselves through these kind of whimsical uh, forms of architecture. And we had Father Sonier building the Tor Magdala, which is a miniature tower, kind of a really neat little feature there, and the Villa Bethania. And both of those features are located on rays coming from the axis there at the chapel as well. And uh, the Chateau Hot Pool, two of the towers there, which is a famous feature of Rain La Chateau, match the axis as well. So when I began to look at the work of Patrice Chaplin, who said that there was a group of people, including Father Saunier, that would do rituals that were actually aimed at Rain La Chateau, as if that was kind of the mecca of their faith. And mm -hmm. in addition to this, in Girona, there's a cathedral with an octagonal feature. And right behind this was another tower called the Tor Magdala that even resembles the one that was later built at Rennes le Chateau. And this is where this woman claims to have seen the rituals occurring. And she uh, even claims to have seen Jean Cocteau there, one of the supposed uh, Grand Masters of the Priory of Zion. Now, whether this story is true or not, it's still, we, we see this mythology being built to this place, you know, in Spain that, that Rain Le Chateau points to. Hmm. So then I began to examine the Girona Cathedral with its octagonal bell tower that was built in about 1590 for its directional attributes. And interestingly enough, first of all, it points to the International Peace Garden. Just like the Shepherd's Monument that the Ansons built at Chugborough, and just like the powder magazine in Colonial Williamsburg and uh, likely Thomas Jefferson's octagonal state poplar forest as well. So when I came upon this information about Girona, I was just startled to see that it was could be associated with the International Peace Garden. Now, not only that, one of the other northwesterly azimuths coming from that octagon, not only does it go through the pentagram that Henry Lincoln delineated, it goes right through Renle Ban, which is another famous site associated with the Renle Chateau mystery and the home of the, the Catholic priest that was thought to actually have masterminded the entire uh, scheme, if you will. But as this line continues, the same azimuth there that goes through the star, it extends to England. And earlier I had identified Avebury as a hexagonal axis that intersected with a place called Abbotsbury on the south coast of England, which is a kind of a hill with a church on top of it, very similar to Glastonbury. So not only the, does Avebury point to Abbotsbury, but also the Girona Cathedral points there. And as the line continues, it intersects directly with Burrow Mump, another line, a famous site on the Michael line. And uh, my model of, of Avebury also included the Michael line being one of the uh, hexagonal rays coming from uh, Avebury. And it transects over Glastonbury Tor precisely and Burrow Mump precisely. So here we have the, the, this Templum I identified in Girona, a city with lore associated with Rain Le Chateau, and it intersects with two uh, famous um, sites of antiquity in Britain that are part of the other Templum. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and like, again, Avebury is associated with the Tower of the Wind, so we see everything being associated with Avebury. I mean, there, there's even a building right that was built recently and it was even featured in the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games uh, called the Coke d'Argent, the poultry building in, in the city of London that has a unique uh, arrow-like pointing feature when viewed from plan view. And this building is odd in that it's famous for people committing suicide there. <laughs> really? And 
Jeez. And it's very near. It's only about 300 meters from the center stone of London, this building. And this, this arrow-like array that's part of the building points the way right to Avebury as well. It, it has a... the. the the poultry building that it has a very kind of strange almost uh, I don't know how to explain it it looks it looks like an ancient plan it also architecturally is kind of reminiscent of actually the MI6 building in London as well with these kind of terraces it has a kind of like almost a Babylonian feature to it Difficult yes to the front there in the lawn in the opening ceremonies the the part where the Queen was flying up the Thames there uh, they passed over that building mm -hmm. and there were some people in the front waving and everything and and uh, we all know the, the symbology in the opening ceremony was interesting with uh, 007 coming to the Buckingham Palace to get the Queen. And we all know that Dr. John D., who was associated with Queen Elizabeth I, his code name was 007. That's so right. They were giving us a little nod there with James Bond coming to parachute into the Olympics with the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Which which was interesting. I thought that was very funny, and the the queen was a good sport to do that. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. I was pretty. Um, yeah, I guess a lot of people were amazed that she actually managed to, um, you know, to 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 pull that off or to to agree to do it rather. <laughs> but yes, there yes. you go. But there was another interesting reference to Avery. That's what really the, this the whole system in Europe during the era I'm speaking of now, the Anson era. Uh, after that, with the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, which is during the 19th century, that kind of filled the same bill uh, that Dashwood and the the Dilettante Society filled, and uh, it w and this is like groups of artists and um, you know free thinkers and things like that that kind of use a, a Masonic framework or maybe associated with the Masons or some group of their own, sort of like the Bohemian Club in San Francisco where they choose to to uh, communicate with each other and build these follies and and uh that have geographical and symbolic meaning to them. So there's a big connection to the Kabbalah I'm thinking through the Girona connection there with Rain La Chateau it seems to all be finally uh coming together where we see these different groups of of Knights Templar that may have once been mistaken for the Priory of Sion and how they developed in France and Britain in kind of a separate way. Let's see if we can uh, talk a little bit about some of the articles that you wrote for Quartz magazine. Uh, maybe uh -huh. you can just tell us about some of the work you've done there. You had some interesting kind of uh, focus basically on uh, uh, Andean Cosmovision, the, the kind of the Incan geomancy, if you will. Tell us about this, Dave. Yeah, I mean, basically... Um what I uh, wrote in the article that uh, Court's already published was really looking at um, how the uh, skies, the, uh, the, the land, if you like, and the human world all interlinked. And I think it reached a sort of zenith with the Inca because they were really drawing on uh, more ancient traditions coming from the Tiwanaku culture and I think much, much earlier than that as well going back, you know, maybe up to 10, 12,000 years BC, in my personal opinion. And what they did was they took certain traditional practices and developed them into a very sophisticated vision of the world in terms of time, in terms of alignment, and everything else. Um, for example, um, in lots of South American cultures prior to the Incas, there were sacred sites that people went to to venerate them, and they were aligned up in straight lines. The, the, these sacred sites or sacred places were called huacas, generally, and they were joined by sesques. Now, when the Incas actually founded um, Cusco, or perhaps refounded it, let's say, but certainly founded it, they basically used the Corricancha, which became known later in times as the Temple of the Sun, as the center point of their whole, I won't say empire, because I don't think it was an empire. They called it the Tawan Tinsuyu, which means the four parts together, the north, the south, the east, and the west. And every tribe that they um, conquered, if you like, really had the choice of joining them or fighting them. And if they joined them, they were given an ancestral alignment along one of these um, 
sesques with their own uh, sacred places along it. And he's often lined up with rising points of certain stars and constellations. But everything met in the Tamwan Sinsuyo, in the center of Cusco. Um, and each tribe had its own priests who were responsible for looking after the huacas or sacred sites on these straight alignments um, during certain times of the year. And there were probably about 40 or 42 of these alignments and some 328 sort of official uh, sacred sites. Um, but it was a very inclusive system. It was a system that actually really gave a unity to the whole of the Inca Empire. And one of the things that I, has struck me since I've been studying how this came to collapse with the, uh, with the, you know, the coming of the Spaniards and the conquistadors is that the, the role played by geomancy in all this was actually very important. Because, <clears throat> I mean, certainly the Spaniards, there were very few um, Spaniards in the, in the party. I think there was about 200 in Pizarro's party when he arrived in what's now Peru. And um, so to overcome this vast empire of, you know, thousands and thousands, even though they had guns and horses and things like that, was quite staggering. And okay, smallpox, which they inadvertently introduced into South America, played a part. But another big part was the destruction of this vast geomantic empire that, that, that the Incas had developed. Um, because what happened was that the Jesuits played a very important role in this, funnily enough. Sure. They had the job on behalf of the See of Rome of doing something called extirpating these traditional sites. So basically they had a manual, which was called the Extirpation Manual. And they used to have a, a strict methodology of going to these, um, these sacred whackers and destroying them. So the indigenous people, the, the, the people of the Inca realm, basically hid all of their, their uh, sacred symbols and sites away from the Jesuits to try and destroy them. But I'm increasingly coming to the opinion that what really happened was that the Jesuits knew the sort of geomantic power of these things in terms of holding a sort of identity together. And it was really part of a deliberate strategy to disrupt and destroy this in order that the social fabric of the, of the Inca realm fell apart. I think this is probably something that's been not really looked at very much in terms of the historical record. Because it's no coincidence either that, um, of course, the, the Spanish built their churches on many of these sacred sites, and they align now in a similar way to in Europe where, um, you know, certainly in Britain anyway, churches were built on megalithic sites, for example, and you see alignments like the Michael Line and the Mary Line in England and so on. Very similar things happened in, in South America, in what's now Peru, Bolivia, etc. And you can follow these alignments from the churches. And one of the things that Court and I did uh, discover in the last couple of weeks, actually, was that on the site of the Corricancha in Cusco, the Spanish built a Dominican convent monastery. And the tower of that monastery is actually an octagonal tower, the bell tower, which, unfortunately, I was going to send Court some pictures of it uh, when I was there last week, but I can't now because I haven't got them. But um, you find octagonal alignment uh, all over uh, in uh, South America with the uh, colonial buildings and so on, and particularly sometimes with um, sort of central squares, Plaza de Armas or town squares, where you'll get a fountain and you will get an octagonal um, font around the fountain, if you like. Mm -hmm. And these very often line up with these ancient uh, alignments that, that predate the Spanish. So that, that's a very interesting feature where another culture comes along and sort of builds on top of the, of the previous culture to impose a new social order, etc. Yeah, it's a, it's a very um, brutal force of doing it. It's, it's uh, sending the message clear far and wide, of course. But do you think that it could be that the, um, the sites that they build on then basically has... Well, if we look at it from this point of view, that, that many of the sites that you've been talking about, uh, Court, so far they might all, to a certain extent, be, be built on a more ancient, older grid work in some way, and they're basically now trying to uh, 
uh, reassess this or reaffirm it or, or strengthen it further. There's tons of different theories about this, but I mean, we could tie into the picture here the kind of the grid of the gods theory of uh, Joseph Joseph Farrell, if you will, that it's it's a it's a kind of a a, a grid that is there to um, uh, not work in in human favor, let's say, and it's being strengthened by these uh, you know ancient orders and occult uh, you know societies. Uh, Dave, any comments on that? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, funnily enough, going back to um, the town of Trinity Tres, 33 in Uruguay, and the the huge concrete obelisk there, uh, if you actually look at it, it's not a true obelisk in the sense that it's actually uh, a pyramid. And uh, I, I read Joseph Farrell's book, The Grid of the Gods, quite recently, and he mentions that there are different kinds of pyramids. And one type of pyramid he identifies based on the work of a certain um, Ukrainian physicist who developed a theory called deep physics. It's called the Sharp Pyramid. And I'm just trying to think of the name of the physicist now, but it's quite unpronounceable. <laughs> and, but basically, he had this idea, and it's similar to a hyperdimensional physics. He called it deep physics, this Ukrainian physicist. Where a sharp pyramid is basically one that, come, that has very long sides and is very tall. And it comes to a point, obviously, very high up. This is just like this particular pyramid uh, or obelisk in, in Trentary Trace. Hmm. And it's a sort of um, arrangement whereby it amplifies or radiates, um, if you like, sub uh, material uh, perturbations in, in time space and is a way of actually producing uh, sub quantum particles out of the ether, if you like. Um, and I thought that was like, quite interesting because it's almost as if it's a kind of parallel to uh, an alchemical idea of, of the sort of rebirth or creation out of, some, out of something out of nothing. And this is all to do with the idea of the phoenix, the alchemical phoenix as well, yeah. which, is all, which is itself associated with obelisks. And that's another thing that recurs <clears throat> through many of these uh, places where uh, in the new... South American republics, they are actually giving birth to new countries out of the decay of the Spanish Empire. So huh. again, it's this layer upon layer that's occurring. Interesting, yeah. Um, Court, what, what do you make of the, the, some of the ideas of the grid of, grid of the gods, if, you've, if you're familiar with the work? Yes, I'm somewhat familiar, and it's very interesting, and what David is seeing there in South America is, is really interesting because it, it seems to echo what's going on in Europe and we, we, we have all of these researchers supposing that there was some sort of pre-Columbian contact but it, you know if you see this you wonder if they didn't come to uh, Peru and see this happening there and take it back to Europe and we, we do see the Michael line itself as it extends across the globe to Lake Titicaca that you know there may be some sort of symbolic geographic uh, connection there and uh, when we go to Tiwanaku there some of the artwork and imagery there with the the uh, sunken uh, gardens they have there with all the different kinds of, of heads there from different ethnicities from around the world seemingly you you, you can start to uh, envision a scenario where, where this was somewhere where for where people from all over the world may have met somehow hmm. and then taken these these um, concepts back to where they were from possibly or they could have developed in Britain and been brought there as well if not just uh, you know developing separately at each place but the the way the axes work and and uh, we we do see at the core concha that it works just like one of the axes I've identified in Europe. We have the, the Cora Concha and Tiwanaku are both oriented to be about one degree uh, west of true north, so they're both one degree off of what it is now, what the rotational axis of the Earth is now, and that is interesting. So we have the Cora Concha pointing a line directly to Tiwanaku, hmm. to the ruins itself, and then Right there at Tiwanaku, Pumapunku is just to the southwest. It is a large square-shaped uh, area, and diagonally that points right to Tiwanaku and even matches the diagonal aspect of the step pyramid at Tiwanaku. 
And then in more modern times, and this may speak to the, the more modern architecture that David's been telling us about there, they have the uh, museum there at Tiwanaku that is situated just between the two sites on this line that connects them both. And the building from plan view is kind of shaped like the Incan axis or the uh, Chicana shape, which forms an octagon. Mm. And the new modern museum is oriented, so one of the facets of that matches the line coming from Pumapunku to Tiwanaku. So they, right there we see the old and the new uh, being mixed together. And it's going to be interesting here in the future to see how a lot of these sites that, that David is talking about line up with each other and possibly with the Cora Concha or other places as well. And to see if the modern Masonic uh, axes are referencing the ancient sites as well or pointing to some of them out of respect. John, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit more about uh, Charleston as a as a vortex of, of supernatural energy. And th this could kind of play into what we talked about here by some kind of grid work that that the city is a it's a node point, if you will, of, of an ancient megalithic uh, a grid. And this is causing, I don't know, certain effects. I, I remember reading a while back on your website, you talked about there being a lot of supernatural activity in Charleston. You, you, you also write, wrote that there actually was a ritual conducted there to, to bring uh, Osiris or Lucifer into the world. Tell us about that. <laughs> yes, uh, Charleston is very supernatural. It's uh, has a, it, it's well known for its ghosts. And uh, as I was growing up around here, I'd always been aware of the ghost issue, but to find out to get into the subjects of um, the occult, the, all the occult aspects of Charleston in itself, you find there's probably a good reason why. And uh, there is. Um, Sirhan Sirhan's attorney, Day Williams, um, once said that if a life is taken close to the 33rd parallel, this fits with Mason's demonic mythology in which they demonstrate their worldly powers by spilling human blood at a predetermined locale. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think about that. I think about how... Charleston is well known for its ghost tours. You can come here and there's many different kinds of tours, but the ones that are most popular are always surrounded by the supernatural aspects of Charleston. And uh, yeah, there was a ritual that happened long ago um, that uh, Malachi Brendan Martin wrote about that ultimately got him killed. Um, but he wrote about how there was a, a ritual that was called the enthronement of the fallen archangel Lucifer. And, um, it, it went hand in hand with a ritual that was being conducted, um, in Rome at the same time. Really? And uh, supposedly this was conducted over the phone in Charleston while there was a, a Luciferian or Masonic or I don't know what label you want to put on it was being conducted here in Charleston at the same time over the phone in order to generate that power that was being generated in Rome. Hmm. And... Uh, there's just so many things about this place. Um, there's a lot of, like I was saying earlier, it's Charleston is known for its wars, um, its death and misery, everything from um, the Native Americans here that were basically killed off, um, and, and, and you know, of course, there's the pirate history here. This was a major pirate location yeah uh, and then you know then you know of American Revolutionary War and the Civil War and of course there's slavery that you know everybody knows about and um, it's just it seems like this area has always drawn a sort of supernatural harnessing of spirits here that can't seem to get out and so I've been wondering if there is a, a connection between these structures 
uh, maybe there's something here that's a lot older than the the Masons or you know the the colonizers. Right. Um, and uh, it, there's just a lot of buried history here that um, it's really hard to know where to dig because there's so much of it. But uh, it's a definitely a supernatural place, and um, I know that this is a, a popular place for ghost hunting, for instance. And so you gotta wonder why, why, why is that? Why is one area more supernatural than other areas? And um, it just feels like there's a sort of connection between that and the and the the star map. Um, maybe it's um, you know keeping these souls trapped in this area. Um, there's, there's all kinds of s speculation that could be made in that regard. There's the um, the Osirian uh, underworld in a certain extent that's being uh, emanated from it, and and again, it's all taking place right there on the 33rd parallel uh, as well, John. And that could have something uh, something to do with it as well. Well, you you mentioned Osirian, and yeah, it, it does because one of the last locations in the star map is uh, where the dead reside in Charleston, and it is a cemetery called Magnolia Cemetery, and this is where the star Sirius would be located, which is the dog star, um, and when we think of the dog star and the gods of Egypt. You can think of uh, Anubis, who was also a, a dog-headed god. He was associated with the dead. And uh, in this location, it, it is just filled with masons who, who, have, who have been buried in this location. And their, their stone heads are obelisks. Um, and there's a, a very large pyramid that is at, at, at the center of this um, cemetery. So um, when I look around Charleston's parks, it's interesting because during the day, you'll see children playing in all these parks. Uh, there's a main area called Waterfront Park where it holds three of the so-called stars of the belt of Orion that I'm associating it with and this area it, it tends to get a lot of the children to come and play in these water parks and so during the day we have a lot of this um, harnessing of youth energy uh, because the other parks are also quite popularized by the college kids that are in the area as well so during the day you have all this youth walking around and then at night you have all this you know, supernatural kind of energy going around. Hmm. Really interesting. Now, uh, guys, I want to want to take a short break here at this point. We're going to um, take a little pause and continue to talk more in the uh, the second hour, second segment. And uh, why don't we uh, just kind of uh, talk about the websites of where people can go to find out more about your uh, individual work, uh, uh, John? Let's begin with you then right away, and please give out your details and where people can read and and, and uh, watch your videos about the star map. Well, if you head on over to cosmicgnostic.com, that website you can pretty much find out about all of everything that I've been speaking about here. I have been developing new videos recently, going back to these parks, revisiting them, and adding even more detail to them. Um, but there has been years of blogs and videos produced uh, that centers around some of this work, and I also talk about and explore many other subjects over at CosmicGnostic.com. And also, uh, I have a a book project that I've been working on that centers around the star map of Charleston. It's called Mysterious Star Map, Charleston, South Carolina, and you can get a copy of it on my website. And um, that's that's basically it. Excellent. Yeah, Mysterious Star Map. That's a really good uh, book as well. By the way, I recommend everyone to check out the videos first if you want to. Uh, see more about that and uh, cosmicgnostic.com will get you more. Uh, Dave, give us give us your website. People know where to go to read more about your stuff. 
Yeah, it's called uh, Beyond Knowledge, um, and the, the actual web address is www.beyond-knowledge.co.uk. I've um, basically put on there a, an extract from the article that I did for the court about a place called Aramomuru, which is a very special place on the side of Lake Titicaca, just a few yards away from Titicaca, a few, well, about half a mile. Uh, and it's a very interesting place, which is uh, one of the sort of whackers that I was talking about before. Uh, very interesting because it, it's uh, got a sort of interdimensional doorway there apparently so I was just writing about that and its mythological and astrological associations there oh, nice um, now have you uh, you do have some video clips and stuff like that on, on the website too is that something you're continuing to do and shoot some video when you're when you're down there yeah I, I sort of did it Brian Forster last year um, when I was down in Paracas and uh, he, he's done a few short uh, sort of videos. He goes around various sites in South America and he, there's a couple of his on um, Aramomura there explaining about the uh, connection with the sort of serpent, the earth serpent of the underworld, which is another common theme that occurs actually across every culture virtually. You see it in Europe with the weaver, which uh, is supposed to be, you know, in, in the, the underneath certain cathedrals like Chartres and Amiens and things like that. And there's the uh, serpent of the underworld, which is, recurs across lots of different South American cultures. Actually, part of the three worlds, the three pashas. And Aramamuru is very much associated with that as well. Very interesting place. Indeed, very good. Beyond-knowledge.co.uk. And then, uh, Court, let's wrap up with you. Then I want to know where uh, listeners can read more, check your videos. You have a magazine, books. Give us the details. Yeah, I've got my uh, my latest book out, Axis Mundi, uh, which does not include the uh, Shugborough Hall information. But uh, you can check me out at survivalcell.blogspot.com. And uh, the True History Journal is for sale there. There's links there and to uh, buy my book as well. And uh, I have 55 videos on YouTube at, on the Survival Cell channel. It has been that that's a special axis of import in American history that was visited long before history says that was possible as well. And we have the octagonal powder magazine in Colonial Williamsburg, which is also seems to be referencing the Tower of the Winds as a reproduction, pointing the way right to the International Peace Garden. We have the Newport Tower in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, pointing the way to the Kensington Runestone in a solstice event. And we have the octagon at the Peace Garden pointing to the Kensington Runestone. Hmm. So, and also, you know, what Mr. Uh, Lewis Buff Perry was involved in was the Stone of Destiny, and he had identified a sandstone pillar very close to the, the border of the United States and Canada that had the Hebrew inscription of Preston written on it, and an alcove dug into the pillar where the stone used to be. So we have that on the same latitude as the International Peace Garden as well. And that's another way of geo-referencing things to a certain axis in addition to the arcs that are extended by the octagons. Hmm. So it all seems to point to the International Peace Garden being of a place of importance. I mean, even Admiral Anson is involved in the tale of the stone that came from the sandstone pillar because he pirated it away from the French. Hmm. On the way, oh, they were bringing it back to France, and his squadron intercepted uh, Admiral Jean Pierre's fleet and captured the stone. And that's a strange story, too, because it, it smacks of being a setup almost that possibly both these men were Knights Templar or members of a, 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 a pendant organization that had more concern with the safety of the stone than whoever possessed it. They might have had right. more allegiance to their group than uh, nationality. Huh. And it's strange, too, because after the fleet was repaired, after Anson got the stone, the fleet went to France and was repaired and was getting to return to the West Indies when he intercepted the fleet again and captured a person known as the Marquis of St. George. And many people suspect that this individual was indeed 
Saint Germain. The real, uh, the real one, huh? The real deal. The, the real, the actual one. I've been looking into him a little bit, and he actually was a real person. He's mm -hmm. not just a figment or a fairy tale. And there are, have been some uh, sources I'm trying to track down of Lady Anson actually speaking of Saint Germain in some of her correspondence. All right. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to have you all uh, with us here, of course. Thank you for taking the time from your uh, busy schedule and uh, getting together for this program. It's going to be really interesting. First of all, uh, welcome back to Court Lindahl. Uh, you were with us most recently. Thank you for uh, coming on back again. Well, it's great to be here, Henrik. I appreciate it. And it's good to finally be here to speak with uh, John and David as well. Really good. Uh, John Cale, a few years ago now since we talked about the uh, Charleston star map, but I'm looking forward to revisiting this today and, of course, tying into our discussion and whatever kind of, I guess, new material and new insights you have about this. So uh, welcome back again, uh, John. How are you? Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Really good. And then lastly, we have uh, Dave Truman joining us from Bolivia today. It was, of course, in 2007, I believe, that we had Dave, uh, Dave last with us briefly. We, we talked about the uh, conference he was putting together in Liverpool, Beyond Knowledge. Uh, Dave was part of that and, and it was a really good turnout. They did a great job on that. So it's good to talk to you again, Dave. It was a while ago. What uh, what have you been up to? Oh, quite a lot, really. Um, I've, I've sort of changed from being a sort of distributor of knowledge to a researcher, I suppose, in the last four or five years. So, um, yeah, I've been enjoying myself traveling around. A few ups and downs, though. Believe you at the moment, and you've you've written some articles for uh, Quartz magazine uh, as well. We're going to get into some of this later on because it's a pretty interesting time. I think. Well, let's begin with Court first. You have a lot of new material: uh, Shugborough Hall mystery, the Renle Chateau mystery. This is where you some of the latest things that you're uh, looking at. Court, let's kind of begin there, I guess, and let's get uh, get things started here. Okay. Well, I'm I'm really excited about that because it's very interesting, and all those places may indeed tie together through the same people that um, maybe were discussed in uh, Henry Lincoln, uh, Bainget, and Lay's book, uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, in the Priory of Zion. And uh, a lot of people, you know, don't believe that the Priory of Zion is a real group of people, and that's entirely possible because of the way that unfolded in the story with uh, Pierre Plantard possibly being uh, a, a con man, but uh, he may have just recognized something that already existed and tried to use it to his own ends. Because what we see is a, a pattern of personalities such as Admiral Anson and his brother Thomas Anson of Shugborough Hall, along with uh, Sir Francis Dashwood, uh, who owned the West Wickham estate there near London. Uh, building a series of follies or whimsical pieces of architecture on their property that all had hidden meanings and uh, attributes to it and directional attributes, uh, obviously, uh, from what I study. So what we see is, is kind of a veneration of the Tower of the Winds in Athens, Greece, which was uh, built in the second century B.C., and was a very advanced uh, timekeeping device and may have actually allowed the Greeks to fit fix longitude and and also as we've discussed before uh, that activity would have all kinds of spiritual and uh, talismanic overtones as you know we know that uh, everything practical and uh, religious was intermingled in those eras so we have later in the 18th century these men all doing the tour of of Europe and the Middle East as well and uh, either being told or prompted to go on kind of a, a, a path of enlightenment through Europe where they learned all the secrets of, of this architecture and among that would be the directional attributes of the Tower of the Winds which uh, is an octagonal structure and uh, it does behave uh, as an axis mundi. And the most interesting and compelling part about the Tower of the Winds is that the 315 degree azimuth created by this octagon leads straight to Avebury, right to the circle in Avebury. So mm. it's, it's kind of like they have two geodetic points on the earth that they were you know, referencing together there. And 
you know, my research did indicate that, you know, the Celtic culture did ex extend to Greece earlier in history. And awareness of this from travel or using the resources that were in England could have made them aware that this was there and to respect it somehow. And uh, we see this later echoed because when the Ansons build their copy of the Tower of the Winds on the Shugborough estate, it's oriented such that it points an azimuth straight through the middle of Avebury and straight through the middle of Stonehenge, all in one line. Hmm. So this is a pretty amazing association of the Antons paying respect to the, you know, the ancient megalithic culture in Britain. And, and also interesting, too, is the other two Tower of the Winds also behave as axis in England, one on Sir Francis Dashwood's estate, and the other one is at Mount Stewart near uh, Belfast, Ireland. And th that Tower of the Winds and the one in Shugborough are oriented to actually point the way to each other. Huh. So the one in Mount Stewart that... So here we have this uh, St. Germain, too, is, is reported to have been the one that created the Order of Strict Observance which I suspect is the group of people that are arranging these Tower of the Winds and these geographic uh, associations in this era. I think they're using a technique that they learned from ancient times and from other alchemical uh, sources and using it uh, for their own ends to communicate and for intelligence purposes. Tell us um, the order or the, or the right of strict observance, what that is for those who don't know, Court. Right. The, 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 the right of strict observance was seemingly uh, more oriented to France and Germany than in England that we know, but we know there were secret connections between the Knights Templar too, irregardless of what nationality they were. And uh, some of the sources say that St. Germain actually created the order of strict observance, and this was a an order of masonry that likely Alexander von Humboldt was a member of and Thomas Jefferson was said to be a member of and th those are kind of sketchy sources that I'm trying to track down better ones but, and we know what a mystery it is with Thomas Jefferson and his Masonic papers are missing so but uh, the order of strict observance uh, may be what Admiral Hansen was a member of and may be actually associated with the Hellfire Club the so-called Hellfire Club of Sir Francis Dashwood may have been a kind of a cover for uh, some of their activities. Hmm. And re really, the Hellfire Club was not uh, known as the Hellfire Club. There were several different Hellfire Clubs, but uh, Dashwood's group was called the Monks of Medenham Abbey. And they actually met in an old Cistercian monastery near the West Wickham Estate where Dashwood built all his follies there. And... Um, and that's interesting, too, because the Cistercian Order is associated with the creation of the Knights Templar. Right. Well, and again, I mean, they, these are the guys who were traveling out to different parts of the world, building up their towers, um, mapping a lot of you know places and following the, the salt lines and stuff like that. So if they had some kind of knowledge about, uh, um, you know, countries previously unexplored or what have you, I think it would be within their order for sure. Yes, definitely. They, they also, you know, we have the missing Templar fleet, and a lot of people suspo uh, suppose that this led to, you know, the the legends of pirates, and and a whole different, um, you know, possibly earlier intervention in North America it was built later in 1800. We see the one in Shugborough being built in the mid 1700s, around 1750. The actual uh, date of construction is debated. But it's really interesting that the the uh, Marquis of Londonderry opted to build his Tower of the Winds there in Belfast and orient it towards Shugborough hmm. as well. So they these guys are going on some kind of uh, um, educational course, uh, you think? Uh, that they're 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 being taught the the secrets of of this kind of knowledge, and then they uh, disseminate it and 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 do it and build these kinds of uh, replicas on, on their own properties and and stuff like that. Yes, if they have the means to, that's obviously part of the uh, what goes on, you know, in being able to even build an array such as this. You're either a, a, a public entity, you know, a state, 
or very wealthy and can do it yourself. And that's why here in the modern world, we do see corporate interest and uh, businesses creating arrays or campuses that they set up with statuary and arranged architecture and such. So that, that, that's really interesting that they seem to be referencing uh, Avebury, um, w which is, the, you know, the oldest uh, culture in Britain. And a lot of, obviously isn't known about it. Everybody knows that those structures have been there for so long and nobody's really sure exactly which culture created them or not. So it's strange that, that you know, Europeans or people in Greece would be referencing Avebury. But we all know that there's theories of trade that, that aren't exactly accepted by the mainstream that say this could be true. But um, what's also interesting about, obviously, Shugborough Hall is the Shepherd's Monument there. And there's there's been a lot uh, said about that through the work of Lewis Buff Perry, who, who uh, decoded the strange inscription on there. It's just a series of letters with dots between them. But uh, he deciphered it and came up with the fact that the Stone of Destiny or one of the teraphim or holy biblical stones was hidden on the Shugborough estate. And all of the lore associated with the Shepherd's Monument says that the Shepherd's Monument will, quote, point the way to the Holy Grail. Now, using the techniques that I've used, I measured the angular orientation of the Shepherd's Monument itself and the northwest azimuth led right to the International Peace Garden on the border of the United States and Canada, which is interesting because my theory to this point